try to start on time. Um, my name is Paul Helft. I direct the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics, and this is our ethics uh, lecture series. Uh, many of you are familiar faces to us, and we're happy to see you again. We're really excited about today's topic. I wanted to say uh, just a couple of words about Lucia Voschel, my colleague, uh, who's been here now almost two years, two and a half. Time flies when you're having fun. So um, let me just tell you a little story about how Lucia came to, to IU and Clarion. Um, so the Fairbanks Center for Medical Ethics has technically existed since 01, and, and I joined in the, in the late part of 04, and then Patty Bledsoe, who many of you know, uh, who became the first program manager, still is the program manager, uh, joined in 05. And Patty and I started trailing around uh, Clarion hospitals on nursing units because uh, we got a couple of requests, kind of informal requests, just to talk about some ethical problem that had come up. And over the course of that first year, we did this seven times with seven different units. I think the first one was probably on the high-risk labor and delivery unit at IU. Maybe it was on the NICU, one of those two at Riley. But in any case, so we started listening to these stories, you know, an hour, hour and a half at a time, that working nurses, bedside nurses taking care of patients in this complex situation, you know, and it was very eye-opening for me. So I'm, you know, full disclosure, I'm a classically trained physician ethicist, meaning I have ignored nurses my entire life, right, until, but this was quite eye-opening for me, and I learned a ton, and, and it sort of took off. So the, we called this program the unit, we started calling it unit-based ethics conversations, and we soon realized that there were 40, depending on how you count them, 4,500, nearly 5,000 nurses just at the downtown campus hospital uh, affiliated with Clarion. So, I mean, that's a lot of, you know, if you multiply that by the hours worked, 365 days a year, 24 hours a day, times the number of hours of you know, human contact and human suffering and so forth, that's a lot of human suffering to deal with. And so we re sort of got this idea that we really needed to put our money where our mouth was about this and say if we're going to, you know, work on the, the, the issues that nurses face and ethical issues that they face every day, we should do something real. So we started to have conversations with Dean Broom and Linda Everett and Suzanne Rogers and uh, several other uh, nurse leaders around the organization and said, what if we created uh, a program that was really based in the Ethics Center but that was responsible for educating undergraduate nursing students and getting them excited about the things, the ethical issues, their ethical lives, not just that, th that this was tough but exciting at the same time. And at the same time uh, gave a voice to ethics and nursing administration at the Clarion hospital system. And so that's how this position came about. So we looked around the country and what we wanted was impossible to find. What we wanted was, a, you know, basically a PhD prepared nurse who was also a clinician and who had lots of years of bedside experience recently, you know, not 30 years in the past. Because we thought that if this person was going to do really good work uh, around the organization at the School of Nursing, et cetera, that they needed to bring a real clinical voice. And uh, we, you know, if you count the number of nurse ethicists in the country, I mean, two of them are in the room, uh, and, and a few uh, others, uh, uh, budding nurse ethicists and otherwise, some of our former fellows, for example, but the number is really small. There aren't, the pool of applicants is really small. And we landed Lucia, the, the process I won't go into the details, but we were really lucky to get Lucia to come. Um, so her background is in neonatology. She has a PhD in nursing from Oregon Health Sciences University, and her PhD thesis um, looked at uh, family struggles around end-of-life decision-making in the NICU. Um, and she has, she, we all say that she hit the ground running and has just done really marvelous things. And I think the best evidence of this is not just that so many of you in the audience actually know Lucia, as kind of the face of uh, ethics at Clarion, uh, nursing ethics and other ethics at Clarion, but uh, that she you know, has gotten to know many of you, leads the unit-based ethics conversations program, which now interacts with 20 plus units around the organization, teaches undergraduate nursing uh, ethics and so forth. So before I embarrass her, I want to say thank you for many things, including giving this lecture, Lucia. Huh? Thank, thank you. Uh, first of all, thank you for coming, and also for those of you who are at Methodist, thanks for coming. You won't be able to talk to us, but you get to listen to us, so um, we hope that that works out for you. This is the first time we've tried broadcasting this across campus, and we hope it's successful. 
Uh, thank you for the introduction, Dr. Helft. I will tell you that um, the issue of moral distress has been around in the nursing literature since 1987. Uh, in my personal and professional life, it was right around that time that I had a rather profound moment of moral distress in which I exercised moral courage and suddenly realized that nurses, um, it was essential that they play an active part in ethically challenging situations in their clinical practice. So moral distress has been something that's been on my radar screen for quite a while. Uh, these are the objectives that I'm going to go through. Um, I won't read them to you because I'm pretty sure you can read them better than I can. I'm going to talk a little bit about moral distress, uh, tell you about an exciting new tool, and then I'm going to give you the punchline, what's the baseline assessment of moral distress of clarion nurses. So I have to acknowledge uh, a number of individuals and uh, people. First of all, thanks very much to the Alpha Chapter of Sigma Theta Tau for their generous grant. Uh, I'm the recipient of their 2009 Research Grant Award, and uh, their money is going to help um, do the data analysis for this project. So I'm very grateful for that. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Michael Weaver, who is the director of the let's see, I have to get this right, Statistical Services Center for Nursing Research and Scholarship at the Indiana, Indiana University School of Nursing. He is my co-investigator, and he was the perfect co-investigator. Uh, moral distress is not something that Dr. Weaver was familiar with, and so I had to justify everything that I wanted to do. I had to convince him that this was a worthy uh, project, and he, um, as a uh, consummate statistician, had me ask questions in a reasonable way, and he would help me identify what was the statistically appropriate way that we could answer the questions. So he was a fabulous and is a fabulous collaborator. I'm sorry he won't be here today, but I needed to acknowledge him. Amy Chamnus would not let me put her picture up on a slide. She is our uh, Fairbank Center Program Coordinator. She's been at the center for a little more than a year, and her visual sense was essential in helping me create some uh, really awesome slides. And I'm grateful for her, and this is sort of the first time I'm, I'm growing up now. I can delegate things to other people. As a practicing clinical nurse specialist for many years, you kind of have to do everything yourself. So I'm sort of getting used to letting go and letting other people do things. Uh, so thanks, Amy, for all of your support. All right, so here we go. Um, I, we need a little foundation in terms of what we're all going to talk about, and some key terms in ethics are um, values, morals, and ethics. When we talk about values, it's typically something of worth. This is something that uh, people use evaluative judgments and decide what they think is good or bad. When we talk about morals, that's how I apply my values to, to my real life. And ethics is really the study of ideal human behavior. Some people will say that morals are about the heart and ethics are about the mind. Morals become intuitive and ethics is sort of the study of how can we practice ideal behavior. When we look at the work of nursing, historically nurses have been um, thought of as virtuous and subservient back in the old days. Um, and we've sort of moved beyond that, which is good. <laughs> We now, um, largely uh, founded in um, the ANA Code of Ethics, is a call for us to be advocates for patients, and that is strikingly different from a subservient role. Um, in nursing, um, in order to understand uh, the moral space of nurses, you have to understand uh, nursing work is about relationships, relationships with their patients, relationships with their physician colleagues, relationships with organizations, and with each other. It's very much a relationship-centered uh, practice. And when you look at the social situations of nurses, um, we have, and I'm sure many of you have heard this, we have all the responsibility and none of the authority. <laughs> so we get to, uh, physicians carry a significant burden of having to make decisions. Nurses carry the burden of having to carry out decisions that have been made by others. Um, and that is kind of a, a, an interesting way to look at um, how nurses carry their practice. So there are some basic assumptions when you look at nurses and their moral practice. First of all, um, nurses face many conflicting obligations. Uh, they uh, take orders from physicians. Physicians can write orders. Uh, they are employed by an organization. Um, they have uh, obligations to themselves as people, to their families, and to other things. And sometimes those obligations conflict. So nurses uh, bring values into their work like any other healthcare professional. It's something you can't set your values at the door. They're part of who you are. Um, but some of the things that nurses have and that they need to consider are what's their moral sensitivity? When we talk about moral sensitivity, we're talking about the ability to recognize conflict in certain situations, to have a contextual understanding of what is happening in the situation, um, and to have insight uh, into the ethical consequences of decisions that are made. When we talk about ethical sensitivity, that's having a knowledge of ethics theories and principles. So both for nurses and for all practicing healthcare providers, 
we may come with a certain sense of moral sensitivity and ethics sensitivity when we enter into our practice, but um, being a good clinician requires continuing to grow and develop both of those sensitivities. So some key concepts. Um, Jamiton is typically the author who's most often identified as the person who named moral distress in the literature. And when he first talked about it early on, he talked about um, moral uncertainty, not really knowing what the right thing to do, a moral dilemma, which is a classic ethics dilemma, more than one right uh, answer applies. And then he talked about moral distress, knowing the correct course of action, but not being able to act because of institutional barriers. Now, in this first iteration of moral distress, it's problematic because it attributes a cause to moral distress, namely the institutional barriers. That particular definition does not account for a nurse's individual responsibility and accountability to do practice. It sort of sets uh, the blame, if you will, for moral distress on someone else. So over time, uh, moral distress has been refined and looked at uh, in many different ways. Jamiton expanded his original definition. He talked about direct, which is the initial feelings that you have in the moment of the situation, or indirect, and that's, you know, there was this situation, I didn't act on my morally distressing feelings, and now I have sort of this reactive distress because I didn't deal with it. Something that's starting to show up in the literature now is, is referred to as moral residue, and that's um, I had moral distress, I sort of got past it, but now it's accumulating. There's this residue behind me. One of the things that um, Ann Hamrick's talked about in the literature is unjustified moral distress. And when she talks about unjustified moral distress, what she's referring to is the quick leap to moral distress without getting all the information, without knowing the whole story. Um, I think a, a kinder, gentler way of, of describing it for me would be premature moral distress. Um, I think many times people get distressed because they're in an ethically challenging situation, and if they just take a break, back up and get all the information, get the whole story, the distress is lessened. Maybe not eliminated, but um, lessened. So here's the definition that we used for this project. The definition was moral distress occurs when you believe you know the correct thing to do, but something or someone restricts your ability to pursue the right course of action. This definition allows for both an institutional uh, cause, if you will, an internal or an external cause of the moral distress. Uh, and that was sort of intentional. It was a little bit vague. Um, so what are the things that influence moral distress? The external factors are the ethical climate. What's your work environment like? What's your peer support like? Some of the internal things are what's my educational background? Have I had any ethics training either in school, beyond school? Uh, what about my moral sensitivity? How's that? Do I have my clinical experience? Typically, the longer you're in clinical practice, the more sensitive you are to ethically challenging situations, in part because as you go from being a novice to an expert, you go from being totally focused on, as my undergraduate students would say, not killing the patient, <laughs> to, okay, now I can see the broader picture. I, I know what my PIXIS code is. I know how to get from A, B, and C. And once you have a basis in your clinical practice and essentially develop clinical confidence, it allows you to see broader application to what's happening around you. And moral agency is really the ability to act on um, your moral sense. So when we look at factors that contribute to moral distress, these are things that have been identified in the literature. Um, these are categories of things, if you will, which have an impact on distress. Uh, the original ones for Corley were um, acting in the patient's best interest, individual responsibility, and deception. Uh, some people have looked at factors in terms of relationships, resources, and time, and then others look at physician practice, nursing practice. So these are different ways of looking at all the things that have an impact on moral distress. So what's the significance of moral distress? Why should you care? This would be, uh, when we talk to our ethics fellows, this is the so what question. So what? Well, uh, the effects of moral distress on nurses. First of all, there are physical and emotional symptoms. Some of the physical symptoms include um, headaches, stomach trouble, diarrhea, uh, and sleeplessness. And then uh, a sense of powerlessness, loss of capacity for caring. This is something that's identified in the literature. It's referred to as distancing from patients, where um, you, you back off. You don't engage as closely with patients, and you lose your capacity for caring. Some of the things, and I was trying to be very clear about this, that are correlated, not cause, is job satisfaction and quitting a job or nursing as a profession because of moral distress. So what's the impact on our patients? 
Well, when you think of distancing of nurses, um, you can think of inconsistent patient care. One of the things often identified in the literature is nurses will talk about requesting not to have a particular patient assignment because it's too hard, it's too difficult, it's too stressful for them, not because of the workload, but because of they have a value conflict with the plan of care. Um, less attentive patient care. Now, there was a recent um, dissertation, which hasn't been translated into an article yet, but uh, Maiden looked at medication errors. She tried to create a model for predicting medication errors. She looked at 10 different variables. Of the 10 different variables, only one significantly contributed to medication errors, and that was moral distress. So um, I'm curious to see if that one's going to make it out into an article. Dissertation Abstracts International is fabulous because you can get an abstract, but you can't get the whole thing. So the early indication is, wow, that's a big deal for patients. What about the organization? These are things that Corley uh, identified early on in her work when she looked at a theoretical model of moral distress. What does it do? What does it have an impact on? When you look at the organization, again, these are correlation, not causation. High turnover rates in nursing because they leave difficulty recruiting if you have um, high levels of moral distress, decreased quality of care, and low patient satisfaction. Now, none of those are things that we want to be known for in terms of uh, uh, an organization. So what are some potential positive effects of moral distress? And these are theorized, but if you look at it, um, it could, being aware of moral distress, uh, developing a sense of it, could lead to a process of healing. In other words, once you name it, maybe you'll be able to do something about it. It could improve your moral sensitivity. Remember, at one point, you may have a very low moral distress score because you're focused on the PIXIS code and everything else. You're not really thinking about ethically challenging situations. But moral distress may be the way to just nick your armor and say, hey, you need to think about this, and that will increase your moral sensitivity. Uh, it could increase your awareness of what are some obstacles to good nursing practice, and hopefully it would, it would lead to improved patient advocacy. So here are some recent headlines in case um, you wanted to know how this impacts. This is now, it's been in the professional literature for over 20 years. Um, I talked to a colleague who was quoted in the New York Times article, Medicine and Moral Distress, and she said she's had more interest in moral distress since the single New York Times article than she has in the last 10 years of the work. So, so get quoted in the New York Times if you have something really important to say. And she said, no, I apologize to the physicians in the room. It was written by a doctor. Now, come on. Moral distress has been in the nursing literature for a long time. And then, of course, life and death scenarios lead to moral distress in nurses. That's from nurses.com. And then in the nursing professional literature, there is a sense that, you know, we've talked about moral distress for a long time, but can't we get a tool that's going to help us measure it? So it's time for a new tool. So the specific aims of the study that we did, and I need to say uh, it's an IRB-approved study. We did go through the process. Uh, was to evaluate the construct validity of a new tool known as the Moral Distress Thermometer, or the MDT. Uh, and we were looking at, most specifically, convergent validity with the Corley Moral Distress Scale. And then conduct a baseline assessment of moral distress of clarion nurses. So for those of you who came to find out what your distress level is, hang on, it's coming. All right, so what methods did we use? Well, the study said, now if I, were, if I were publishing this in a journal, I would say at a large Midwestern tertiary care center with three academic hospitals. Uh, you all know that as Methodist IU and Riley, however. Um, the subjects were, we tried to focus on inpatient nurses in part because the original moral distress scale was created for inpatient nurses. In fact, it was targeted to critical care nurses. Um, how did we recruit people? Um, so some of you may know that I write a monthly column in The Synergist, which is an electronic newsletter that goes out to nurses. And um, one of my columns, the launch, if you will, of the uh, survey and data collection was an article in The Synergist. And then um, after that, two weeks after that, we followed it up with email invitations to people um, whether or not they'd like to participate. So I keep talking about these instruments, so let's tell you a little bit more about it. This is Dr. Mary Corley. Uh, she is a retired professor from the Virginia Commonwealth University School of Nursing. She was the first person to do an in-depth theoretical analysis and construct of what is moral distress, what are the impact on uh, nurses, patients, and uh, organizations. So her work uh, was stellar. So she was the one who, sit, who sat down and said, let's see if we can come up with a scale to measure it. So her theoretical framework was looking at moral distress, looking at role conflict theory, and looking at values and value systems theory. So she used those theoretical constructs to come up with this scale. It originally had 38 items. It looked at measuring each of those items in terms of their intensity and their frequency, 
Um, and she did uh, enough uh, statistical work to, to know that it was both a valid and reliable tool for measuring the construct of moral distress. This is the tool that's most often used in studies where people cite outcomes of whatever. They use the moral distress scale, which was created by Mary Corley. So it is considered the gold standard. Um, unfortunately, when she did the study, it wasn't clear what your score meant. <laughs> so you could have a low score, a medium score, a high score. You would know what your score was in relation to the population of the people who were in the study, but it wouldn't necessarily tell you overall what that meant. So um, now for those of you who took statistics in college, I'm sorry, I have to tell you, I have to remind you about some of that. <laughs> so I have to avoid any little post-traumatic stress, but, um, and I, I was telling Dean Broom here, my dissertation work was qualitative research and I'm presenting quantitative research studies. I feel a little bit like I'm defending my dissertation, but so I want to tell you that when you look at developing an instrument and Mary Corley's tool is great, it's, but it's 38 items intensity and frequency, it takes a long time to fill it out. Most people don't have a lot of time to fill it out. So what I said is I needed to look at a tool um, that could evaluate the underlying phenomenon or construct. So we call it a construct. In this case, that's moral distress. And we call it a latent variable. We call it latent because it's hidden. You can't measure it directly. You can measure eye color directly. You can measure hair color directly, but you can't measure moral distress directly. So it's latent. Variable means that it varies. It changes over time. Uh, you can't, it's not constant, so you have to look at it. So when you're looking at a tool, you have to look at um, the, the tool, the score that you're going to obtain, theoretically, is the result of the latent variable, in this case, moral distress. So whatever score I get, it should be a representation of the true score. Okay, so what's the true score? I just told you that we can't measure directly moral distress. So in this case, Mary Corley's original moral distress scale is considered the gold standard. So that scale score is considered the true score. So when we looked at developing the moral distress thermometer, we measured it against the moral distress scale. So for those of you who endured both tools, thank you. That's why you were doing both of them, two different tools. Anne Hamrick, I've mentioned her name before. She is a um, professor in the School of Nursing at the University of Virginia. And she is um, a colleague, mentor, and a friend. And if I told you that last year at this time at a conference, she and I were sitting in a hotel room poring over how we could construct this particular design, for any of you who've had the pleasure of having an aha moment with a colleague, um, my conversations with her last year really led to the solidification of this project. So I'm very grateful for her. She took Mary Corley's tool and she said, hey, 38 items is too long. Can we shorten it? <laughs> and by the way, nurses aren't the only people who experience moral distress. What if we try this tool out on physicians? So she took Mary Corley's tool in collaboration with Dr. Corley and said, hey, what can we do to change this? Okay, so if I wanted to do something with Mary Corley's tool, I wouldn't be the only one. So this was good news to me. Um, these two individuals, Ann Cook and Helena Haas, I met these two individuals at a um, conference when I was in graduate school. The picture that you see there is a picture of a bookmark that they created. It's a front and back side of a bookmark. Um, they are with the University of Montana at a rural bioethics project. And this project is designed to provide resources to people. Now, any of you know something about Montana, you know that it's very big, not a lot of people, not a lot of resources concentrated in any one place. So people, while we have a lovely academic center and multiple resources, people in small community hospitals in rural Montana don't have much. They created this bookmark as a way of helping nurses develop a language. You see the back side of the bookmark is a bunch of words and phrases to help them learn a little bit about the language of ethics. And then on the front side, now they called it the moral distress scale, not knowing about Mary Corley's scale. They never intended it to be um, uh, an accurate measurement of anything. It was just kind of a fun thing to do. But if, so if anybody in pediatrics, and we aren't Riley, so some, many of you may look at that bookmark and go, hmm, looks kind of like the facies scale to me, the facies pain scale. I'm in pediatrics, neonatology, this is my background. Now, Patty Bledsoe, uh, you can't see her in the picture. That was her design. I want to point that out. She wanted it to be less about her as a person and wanted it to be a better representation of something uh, that is near and dear to her, which is when you face moral distress, you have to exercise personal risk and develop moral courage to do the right thing. Patty um, is, uh, by training, a social worker, social worker extraordinaire in oncology. Patty and I also carpool. 
which for better or for worse, gives us abundant time together in the car. And I was very excited about the development of what I was sort of theorizing what my new tool would look like. And she said, oh, well, we have something like that. And cancer, let me show you. <laughs> so Patty Bledsoe showed me a copy of this. This is the cancer thermometer. If you look at the cancer thermometer, and I need to say it's in really, really tiny print, but because we actually obtained formal permission, I will tell you that this is reproduced with permission from the NCCN um, for 2009, Distress Management, and it's the Clinical Practice Guideline in Oncology um, for the National Comprehensive Cancer Center. So they allowed us to reproduce this so that we could show you. Keep in mind what this tool looks like. Okay, so this is a whole lot of buildup. Where am I going with this? We're almost there, just a second. Many of you will recognize this. This is a visual analog scale. Pain, right? What's well, the fifth vital sign, right? Zero to one. When you look at a visual analog scale, the point of looking at something like this is it's a graphic rating something that people can see, um, and the line is meant to represent the full range of possibilities. It's from nothing to everything possible. So when you look at a visual analog scale, one of the major advantages of this is it has the potential for sensitivity for a concept that's being measured. Not only that, it has the potential to measure it before and after an intervention. For those of you who have to do pain, you know this. You do a pain score, it's high, you provide an intervention, and you go back within half an hour, an hour, and you rate the pain again. And it's a very effective tool for doing that. So the moral distress thermometer is a visual analog scale that was created using the moral distress bookmark, for lack of a better word to call it, the thing from Montana, and the cancer distress scale as a model. That's really um, how I came to it. So. If I could do a drum roll, I would. This is the new tool. It's called the Moral Distress Thermometer, and you can see it goes from 0 to 10, um, and it has uh, descriptors on the side, which are pretty close to the descriptors that were used in the Moral Distress bookmark. It goes from none, mild, uncomfortable, distressing, intense, and worst possible. Uh, so just a, as an aside, we did ask people when they did our, our survey, did the name have any impact on you, you know, moral distress? <laughs> Less than 10% of people identified the name meaning something, and when I read through all of the comments on that, less than 5% of the comments had to do with the name. For the most part, the name really didn't affect how they felt about it, so that was good news. All right, so here are the results, and I say preliminary because this is the beginning. When you do um, a lot of quantitative research, you have to start somewhere, and we've started, and this won't be all the results that I'm sure many of you hope to hear, but it's a start, and I think it's a really important one. So when we looked at the respondents, initially we had 1,061 respondents. Wahoo! That was great. So that's the small r. However, for the purposes of looking at this tool, we needed to have not just people who responded, but people who actually slogged through and got to the end. So there were 529 who completed both the moral distress scale, the moral distress thermometer, and the demographic stuff. We had um, over 200 from the synergist and over 300 from email. So uh, that was a pretty good response rate from both. So the total N, um, the sample that we were choose, the sample of nurses that we were selecting, uh, and it was anywhere between 3,751, which is the number of email addresses that HR gave me for inpatient nurses, up to 5,772, which is the number that we used in our magnet documents for employed nurses at Clarion, not just inpatient, but inpatient, outpatient, on the main campus. So our response rate was anywhere from 18 to 28 percent or as low as 9 to 14 percent. So it wasn't great, it wasn't what we hoped for, um, but I'm still grateful for those of you who did this. So thank you very much. So what's the difference between R, the people who tried, and big R, the people who actually got to the end? First of all, we knew the Corley tool was long. That was one reason we wanted to create a smaller tool. So we broke it up. We did this electronically on SurveyMonkey. We broke it up. Between pages one and two, we had a 10% drop-off rate, just like that. So 10% of people, once they got to the bottom of the first page, they thought they were done and they moved on. Um, people who were more likely to provide us complete data were um, Caucasian in the adult population, meaning adult, people who take care of adult patients, non-direct care providers. Uh, that's likely because they wouldn't necessarily be called away from trying to complete something in the middle of it, and um, had previously re requested an ethics consult for people who identify themselves as pediatric nurses. But what we, when we looked at all of the statistical numbers and sorted out, essentially, my statistician colleague, Dr. Weaver, assured me that essentially there was no difference between the two groups. 
So the results that I'm going to present to you are largely based on the small group of 529 because that's the most complete data that we have. So here are some subject demographics that matter. The white numbers are from our study, and the pink numbers represent clarion-wide. So if you look, um, our female was pretty much right on. Caucasian, we had a slightly higher percent, and we knew that. In terms of educational background, in general, we had a stronger representation from people who had at least a bachelor's degree or greater. And then in terms of looking at the hospitals, we had a larger representation from Riley than would have been statistically expected within the general population of clearing nurses. Also, if you had certification as a nurse, you were more likely to provide us with complete data. Um, as people uh, looked at their practice, we had a stronger representation of people who were in critical care or progressive care. Um, and then adult and pediatric, I don't know exactly how that breaks out, but I think um, it's probably pretty close. So here's where I get to do one of, um, sadly, what well, we more than one disclosures about failures of mine on the part of a researcher and a nurse. I did not provide a category for OR nurses or OB nurses. And more than one person sent me an email and said, where do I fit? <laughs> where do I belong? Now, I said to somebody in the OR category, okay, if I'm in the OR and you're taking care of me, I want you to think of me as a critically ill patient, <laughs> so put yourself in critical care. And anybody who's been to the OB ICU at IU knows that OB is not just fun and games. It's a very intense population. But so there are some people who had to pick one, and it wasn't necessarily the place that they would have lived with. So I didn't intentionally leave you out. I apologize to my colleagues. All right, so how does it look? First of all, in terms of our ages of subjects, you can see we have a pretty good distribution of people. Um, I'm really impressed at the people who are more than 60 years old and still doing nursing. Um, I'm hoping to be one of those people when I get to that age. So it's a pretty nice distribution across the, uh, the field. Okay, here's the second disclosure. You know, when you go from a paper to an electronic thing, sometimes you leave something out. There was no drop-down choice for people in years as a nurse, 10 to 15 years. So if you were 10 to 15 years as a nurse, you had to figure out which way to put yourself in. So I apologize, and, and my slide collaborator and I discussed whether or not we should hide the slide and just not actually do the bar graph or come clean. Well, I'm an ethicist, so I'm coming clean. I left out the category. That's right. Yeah, there you go. So, yeah. Yeah, so there you go, public accountability. We just forgot to put it in the drop-down. So there you go. Um, but if you look at it, again, we have pretty good distribution. There are a lot of nurses who answer this survey who've been a nurse for more than 25 years. That's pretty impressive. Again, there's that missing category. <laughs> but we can say in terms of years um, on a unit, the majority of people, more than 50% of nurses, have been on the same unit for less than five years. So this just gives you an idea. All right, so... Again, we had two different scales. Mary Corley created an adult version of the moral distress scale and a pediatric version. So we had the adult people do the adult version and the pediatric people do the pediatric version. But what happened was they have different total item numbers. And so uh, instead of giving you the actual number, we say percent possible because one item, one scale had 35 items and one scale had 36. And so we couldn't do them exactly the same. So we say the adult possible uh, percent possible for the moral distress scale. If you look at the green bar, that comes approximately to what the mean was for the adults. And the approximate mean is somewhere about, um, it's between 17 and 20. And then if we look at, now I should tell you, of a, of a total possible for the moral distress scale when you looked at it, if we did it in raw numbers, the moral distress scale went from zero to over 300 because of how it was calculated. When Ann Hamrick modified it, she said, you know what, if people never encounter something, in other words, if their frequency is zero, we really ought to drop it out. So she figured out how to do a composite score, which made it a more reasonable number. So percent possible for peds, you can see that the mean is a bit lower. So pediatric nurses have a slightly lower score on the moral distress scale. So that's good news. Then if we combine them both, you can see how challenging this tool is. It goes from zero to way, way high, and you can see how stretched out this is. And people who are way on the other end, you know, they're feeling pretty lonely out there. Although I have to tell you, I'm a little concerned that people who had 10 on everything, that they confuse the scale, and you know how you go down and you're zero and you're marking the wrong side, because otherwise somebody was, they had pretty much the maximum score, which is they're maxed out on everything. All right, so how did that look when we looked at the moral distress thermometer? So when we looked at the difference between the moral distress scale and the moral distress thermometer, what we found um, is that 
the adult score, it was about a three, a little bit more than a three, and the pediatric score was closer to two. So again, pretty close. So when we combined them, and the reason we combined them is when we did the statistical analysis and looked at the difference between adult responders on the moral distress thermometers, or thermometer and pediatric responders, there was no statistical difference between the two groups. Even though they're slightly numerically different, statistically it wasn't, so we combined them. So you can see side by side, green is pediatric, yellow is adult. You can see we're doing, you know, pretty well. It's looking pretty good. And there's how it looks combined. So again, the mean shows up at about three on a scale of zero to 10, moral distress score. The mean for people, for nurses at Clearing is about a three. That's pretty low. That's okay. So what do we know about the difference between the moral distress thermometer and the moral distress scale? The things that are highlighted in red are things that had statistical significance. So there is a difference between the two tools. If we look at them, um, in terms of the moral distress scale, there was a gender difference that was detected. Both scores picked up differences based on patient acuity, meaning general progressive or critical care. In terms of patient type, adult versus pediatric, the moral distress score was a little bit more sensitive to that. Both tools were extremely sensitive, that less than you know, 0 0.0001, that's an important number, um, for people who were considering quitting. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. And then um, the moral distress thermometer was more sensitive for nurses who had been in clinical practice longer. So when you look at all of these different demographic things, what you're trying to do is identify what causes variability in the moral distress score. So when we threw in all of the demographics that we had, the age, years of service, ethnicity, all the rest of that, we could only account for 15% of the variability in the moral distress score, which is pretty consistent with what Mary Corley found in terms of she knew that it was a complex phenomenon and we were only scratching the surface in terms of trying to identify what accounted for the variability in the scores. So that's what this visual representation is, where those two um, shapes overlap is where our demographic could explain some of the moral distress score. What that means is other things are contributing to the score. Marital status, religiosity, what's the perception of their work environment. There are many other things that contribute to moral distress. Okay, back to statistics class. So if you took statistics and lived through it, you probably know that a, if you're doing a correlation coefficient, 0.9 is good. 0.9 is great, actually. So if you look at this and it says your Pearson's correlation coefficient and your Spearman is about 0.4, well, that doesn't didn't make me very happy initially, and I um, spoke with Dr. Weaver about it, and he said, now wait a minute, let's keep this in perspective. First of all, you went from a 38-item tool to a single-item tool, so you would expect a drop in the correlation. Okay, so I'm feeling a little bit better. The other thing you need to appreciate about when you're looking at construct validity is there's no single cutoff that says, yes, you have it, no, you don't. You have to consider it in the context of other things. Now, here's where that 0. .0001 less than thing comes into, uh, uh, um, into play, and that is when you look at total chance. Let's say there was absolutely no relationship between the two tools. I was really measuring the difference between what color their hair was and what their moral distress was. There's no relationship whatsoever. The chance that these two tools would have had a 0.4 correlation coefficient is less than one in a thousand if there was no relationship. So what that says is there's a good relationship between the two of these. It, was, it didn't happen by chance. No, it's not totally strong, it's not 0.9, but it's good, it's solid, particularly when you're looking at construct validity. So that actually is pretty good news. When we look at it, um, it suggests that there is con um, construct or convergent validity between the two tools. So here was one of the major questions of the study. Is the moral distress thermometer a reasonable measure of moral distress? And the answer to that is yes. That's a big deal. We've gone from a 38-item tool, which takes at least 20 minutes to fill out, to a single-item tool that takes probably less than 10 seconds, depending on what your moral stress is, of course. So the tool is sensitive to moral distress. That is a good thing. Uh, in its present form, it can't determine what specifically contributes to the moral distress. Right now, it's just a thermometer. Um, and it's not able to predict anything about the people who have moral distress. Um, so what do we know about Clarion's nurses and their moral distress? In general, the moral distress level of nurses at Clarion is actually pretty low. 
Nurses um, have higher moral distress scores, and this is based on uh, the moral distress thermometer results, if uh, they work in critical care, progressive care, if they answered the question, there were three questions at the end of the thermometer that said, have you ever considered, have you ever quitted, quit a job because of moral distress, yes or no? Have you ever considered quitting a job because of moral distress? Um, and uh, so when you ask those two questions, the higher your moral distress is, the more likely you are to have answered yes to those questions. Um, yes? Mm -hmm. then the, answer will be the, same. the answer in terms of what their level of moral distress was? Yes. Yes. In terms of would they have answered this question the same, the am I going to quit, am I not going right. to quit? It's the same. It would have been the same. The predictability, remember back on that table that was white and pink? Yeah. Both of these scales are very sensitive to the answer to that question. If they answer this question yes, their moral distress score is likely to be higher. Um, so nurses... Uh, with more years of experience, have a lower moral distress score. Now that is different than what's reported in the literature. In the literature, the longer you've been in clinical practice in general, the higher is your moral distress score. So here is the fabulous slide, which I'm so excited about because Chamis and I sat around, how can we represent this? And I'm not a visual person. Amy's very much a visual person. So if you look at this, there's the thermometer on the left. Um, my statistician colleague said, you know, let's look at this in terms of standard deviations. So anybody that's blue or below is at the mean or below. That's good news. If you're green, you're, you're within one standard deviation above the mean for moral distress. If you're in yellow, you're between one and two. And if you're in the red zone, you are more than two standard deviations above the mean for clarion nurses. Now, if you look at that cute little pie graph, point of trivia, Florence Nightingale is attributed to creating pie, gra pie graphs. Um, if you look at that little pie graph, 30. 30 nurses at Clarion uh, identify there are more than two standard deviations above the mean. That's a significant thing. I'm going to talk about that in, in a little bit. But when you look at um, this as a qualitative researcher, I, wa I was concerned about people who were six or above because the words on the scale six or above are six is distressing, eight is intense, and 10 is worst possible. So if you looked at six and above, that was 97 nurses or 18%. It's still a lot. So when we ask this, moral distress and intent to turn over, this is in the literature a lot. What people are very cautious about is we can't say this is a causal effect, but we can say that there's a correlation. So nurses who had quit or considered quitting um, because of moral distress had the higher moral distress scores. So what that says is when we asked the question, we didn't say specifically, are you considering quitting your current position? We didn't ask it that way. We probably should have, and in the future we might. <laughs> if we had answered it that way, what we could say is 6%, um, 30 nurses at Clarion are considering quitting. So let's make this concrete. And I checked with one of my colleagues in HR. At Clarion, we estimate that it takes uh, about $70,000 to train a med surge nurse, train and replace, recruit, train and replace, 90000 to train, recruit, and replace a critical care nurse, and about 110000 to train and recruit an OR nurse. Let's say we distribute those 30 nurses across each of those three areas. Um, what that translates into dollars and cents, if we identify these 30 nurses, 5.6%, as being at risk for leaving, that represents $2,700,000 in recruitment, training, and replacement of those nurses. So our study clearly has limitations. It's a self-selection bias. Clearly not everybody filled out the survey. Um, our response rate limits our ability to make it generalizable to all Clarion nurses. But we do have enough information that says to us, uh, the baseline information suggests that there are nurses at Clarion who have moral distress and they may be at risk for leaving because of it. So when you do research, it typically creates more research questions for you. Is there um, an optimum level of moral distress, like regular stress? Too low is not good, too high is not good. Is there an optimum level? Can we um, refine the moral distress measure um, in terms of, can we look at interventions uh, to decrease moral distress? Can we use that? Can we say, here's your moral distress scale score, 
we're going to, excuse me, here's your moral distress thermometer score, here's your intervention, and now we're going to test you again. Will it be able to work that way? What's the relationship between moral distress and moral agency? In other words, I have feelings about moral distress. What about moral agency? My actions, if I um, do ethical acts. And will it work for non-nurses? So we have more data analysis to do. Remember I said this was preliminary data work. We have the moral distress scores for those 529 people who provided us with both. So what we're going to do is look at specific factors on the moral distress score for the clearing nurses and try and identify what's contributing to it. Now, the one question, this is one of the items from the Corley's moral distress score, or scale, excuse me, is um, to uh, initiate extensive uh, life-saving um, actions when I think it is merely prolonging death. And that was a question that gets at uh, medical at futility. Uh, Dr. Helft and I would have a great debate about how we define futility, but we won't, that's a separate talk. But this was the category that people look at. And when you identify this as a category, and it is the most often cited category that contributes to high levels of moral distress in nurses, um, what, we, what we need to know is, um, what does it mean? Can we say, can we look at our moral distress thermometer and create a factor that would allow us to say, yes, this is one of the things that's contributing to this? So remember the moral distress thermometer and you wondered what all those words were on the right? Those are factors. Those are categories. So if we take what we have with the moral distress scores from all those nurses who did the, the table for us, can we come up with factors like these for the moral distress thermometer? So I could rank where I was in the thermometer and then check a box what's contributing to it. It would be that simple. That would be an ideal thing. So what about the implications for practice? One of the things um, that William Bartholomew, uh, a pediatrician and colleague at um, the Center for Practical Bioethics in Kansas City said, in order for nurses to claim moral distress, first of all, they have to be able to describe it. They have to be able to say what it is. Uh, they have to be able to know their own personal values in order to claim it. Uh, and it's an important thing. So first of all, we need to help nurses name it. What is it? What does it mean? Uh, we have to give opportunity to discuss it. Um, this is my first shameless uh, acknowledgement. Um, Maureen Hancock and I presented a, a presentation at, at uh, the Magnet Conference last Friday, which showed evidence through our unit-based ethics conversation program that being able to participate in conversations about ethically challenging situations is a benefit. We didn't measure moral distress because we didn't have this cute little thermometer at the time, but we may be adding it. And then um, can we measure it on a regular basis? So what I was thinking, wouldn't it be nice if you look at this thermometer, it's different than the other one. Notice the peak is not at 10, and the red zone is a lot smaller. What if on a regular basis I, as a nurse, could know on my unit where I was? Am I within one, two standard deviations of the mean? Am I off the map? And um, I was doing a unit-based ethics conversation not that long ago, and one of the nurses, this was right around the time I was doing data collection, and we were in with the, done with the conversation. She said, yeah, but there's one other thing I want to talk to you about, and I'm a 10. I just want you to know, I'm a 10. And I turned to my colleague and I said, she just did the survey. <laughs> She's talking about the moral distress thermometer. So I think, for me, it's great to look in the literature and see what's the frequency and intensity. Was it related to futility? Was it related to competence of colleagues? All of that's really important, but... I don't want to know what's in the literature. I'm a practicing bedside nurse. I want to know what it's like where I am. And if I had the ability to do this, would, would that be a helpful thing for nurses? I want to hope so. So at Clarion, we have, we're blessed with a, an abundance of resources. We have an ethics consultation service. We have an ethics committee. We have the unit-based ethics conversation program. We have healing sanctuaries, the gift of caregiving, which is a retreat. We have healthy work environment initiatives, and we have a just culture here, and we're trying to implement a sort of balanced way of looking at and being able to openly discuss ethically challenging situations. So moral courage is something that we all need, and when you look at it, um, Vicki Lockman, who's a nurse, came up with a mnemonic because, of course, mnemonics help us all. <laughs> so when you look at moral courage, um, it's the courage to be moral. O, C-O, is obligations to honor. There are things I have to do. D is danger to manage. And E is expression and action. I have to do something. I have to act. So code is that. And the space between knowing what the right thing to do and acting is bridged by moral courage. It's something that we all need.
So I have to say some specific thank yous. Dr. Health mentioned a few of them. Um, I am here because the Methodist Health Foundation provided a grant to the Fairbank Center for Medical Ethics to establish the program in nursing ethics, and I am most grateful to that. The Fairbanks Foundation has provided a sustainability grant to the Ethics Center so that um, I can stay, at least part of me can stay. Dr. Helft is our medical director, and um, he was uh, kind enough to give me the opportunity to come and do my dream job, which is pretty fun. Dr. Linda Everett, who is our chief nurse executive, also bought into, yeah, this is a good thing, and I think our nurses deserve to have someone addressing moral distress. And Dean Marion Broom at the School of Nursing said, what a great idea. Let's collaborate. Let's build a program between a hospital and a school of nursing, and let's see what we can do. Someone who lives in clinical practice who can teach ethics. So I'm grateful to all of these people. I'm grateful to all of you. And now if you have any questions, I'd like to entertain them. I'm going to ask Dr. Health to help me pick people out of the audience. So thank you. I have the first comment, and that is I'm concerned about the, um, the acronym you're using for moral distress, which is MD. <laughs> Did anybody did anybody else pick up on that? Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. I you know did you see that slide? Are MDs the cause? Is MD the cause of? Sorry. It's all subliminal, isn't it? Okay. <laughs> Questions. Well, that would be easy. <laughs> so do, do you think you're you're measuring moral distress or measuring distress moral distress residual because these individuals are answering their surveys probably not mm -hmm. at the heat of their worst part of the day, but right. you know, at different stages of it. So how do you correct that? The question was, are we measuring moral distress or are we measuring moral distress residual? And actually, when we asked the question on our particular survey, what we asked them to do is consider your work within the last two weeks. So we gave them a time frame to think about. We didn't say today. We just said within the last two weeks. But in conversations with my colleague, Ann Hamrick, who's working on developing um, a concept and theory of uh, the residual moral distress, um, I can't know if I'm measuring that until we know whether or not we can measure moral distress accurately. So we hope to be able to use the thermometer to measure moral distress over time and then know whether or not there's a residual. Because what she's described, what she's theorized, is in the literature you would see a crescendo. You would see these peaks of moral distress related to a particular patient situation. It get, gets resolved one way or another. The moral distress come down, comes down, but it doesn't come down to baseline. It's a little bit higher. And then it goes up. And up, it's sort of a sawtooth thing going up a curve. So right now, we hope that what we were measuring was a, a baseline level based on them thinking about their last two weeks. But it's a very good question. We don't know yet. Thank you. Mike. One of the things that I'm always kind of iffy about is actual validity of any any designed to measure a concept. Mm -hmm. And it, it, you know, it certainly has face validity because you can look at all those things and say, okay, those should be signs of moral distress. But it's still kind of hard to come up with what moral distress is. Yeah, and so Mike's, Mike is the um, institutional curmudgeon and <laughs> by his own admission. So he's skeptical that this tool isn't really measuring what it's measuring. And one of the things that Hamrick talks about is we have to be careful in how we define it, because it's not just emotional distress, because clearly some of these situations cause an emotional reaction. What makes it different is can you look at the ethics piece of it, the moral piece of it? Um, you know, I, I have to tell you, I have some, some doubt whether anything can accurately measure such a complex construct, but I think it can be sensitive to the presence of it. Is it going to measure it accurately? Is my five the same as Marion's five or the same as Paul's five? Probably not, but it gives us something concrete to deal with when we're trying to get our arms around an abstract concept. Because the distress that's associated with, associated with thinking that I'm supposed to be doing something and I can't do it, whether it's because I need more moral agency or my employer won't let me do it or there's no policy that allows me to do it, that's very real. That's very real. So it's not perfect, it, I, and I agree with you. It's a very complex construct, and we may not be measuring it exactly, but is it good enough? And I think yes. Yes. You and then you had your hand up there, Andrew. Um, I was wondering if work overload, sometimes that's what makes you unable to do what you know you should be doing. And to me, that would be hugely residual. So, so the question was, what about work overload? <laughs> and, and when you look at moral distress in the literature, there are three things that we've looked at that, that have been explored. And that is, does moral distress lead to burnout? 
or the two related in some way? Does moral distress lead to that distancing? In other words, I'm just going to back off. I'm not going to do it. And then, or does it give me moral agency? Am I more likely to do something? And I would tell you on any given day, if I'm really tired, I don't care if normally I have really abundant moral courage and I'm a strong moral agent. I'm tired and I can't do it today. And, and that's a reality, which is why the tool is not perfect, because some days it might be higher or lower. And I may or may not be distressed about the fact that, remember the conflicting obligations? I've got obligations to patients, my own personal family, my colleagues, physicians. On any given day, those obligations weigh more or less on the scale. So I may have more moral distress on a day when my obligations are more seriously conflicted. So I think having a bad day, just having a bad day, would contribute. Oh, you mean if you're overworked consistently? Consistent yeah. yeah. Right. One of the things, right, one of the things on the 38 item score has to do with do I consistently work with not enough resources? So remember, I, I don't have the factors on the side of the thermometer yet. That's what's yet to come. Hopefully when we look at those items that were answered here, we can say, okay, these factors contribute, and then I can check the box that this is what's contributing to it. Good question, Phyllis. I'm sorry, I don't know your name. I'm Jennifer Flyer. Which I know with our career advancement program that we have and our opportunities mm -hmm. yeah. to be humbled by the um, experiences that our nurses share with us, mm -hmm. their story writing and exemplars, um, you know, we see a fair amount of moral distress mm -hmm. in those. Um, what opportunities do we have to um, take forth to action what, what we are finding in those exemplars and what we can do with that? So the question was, as part of our career advancement program, nurses are invited to write exemplar stories. And Jennifer is one of the people who reviews these stories. And she can say that there is um, a fair representation of stories that have a theme of moral distress in them. What can you do? Well, if you look look back and think implications for practice, what we know from our unit-based ethics conversations and what I know from one of our fellows projects this past year, Susan Elpers did a project with experienced nurses sharing stories with junior nurses, doesn't make a difference. And what we found is a lot of those experienced nurses have never told those stories. They've never shared them with anybody. And so there's so much evidence in the literature that sharing stories is a valuable tool, both for others to learn and for the storyteller to gain deeper understanding about it. So when you ask, are there opportunities? Absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, one of the many ideas that I have is to go through the stories that have been submitted as part of the CAP program and look at, um, can we do a narrative discussion of moral distress experience of nurses? And I think we can. I think there's huge a huge wealth of information there. And I think for all of the nurses who have those stories, they need to start realizing the value of telling them, not just completing them for the CAP program. I was stunned at how many people who've written those stories have never told them. Uh, and and I, I know that you know it is um, a bit challenging and, and frightening to folks to even be approached to be willing to share more of this with someone. And I know you and I have had a recent really yeah. There's, there's a sense of being very vulnerable. If I admit that I have it, was it so, now one of the things, one of the points that I want to make is if you have moral distress, that does not mean you have a weak moral character or that you're in dire straits, which were two comments that came up about the title of the survey. Oh my God, if I have moral distress, somehow my morals, my values are weaker. They're, that's not what this means. And that's something that we have to get people to appreciate. It's not about your personal values or morals. It's about the ethics, the behavior of what you're doing and, and how you sort that out. So it is very vulnerable to tell your story and wonder, is somebody going to you know, jump all over, well, you did the wrong thing, or you, didn't, or you should have done this, or you should have done that. And it is a very scary place to be, and I think that's why people don't tell the stories. Dean Brown, you had your hand. Excellent presentation. I think we'll sign you up to teach psychometrics. <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah. Do scenarios to do discriminative validity. Mm -hmm. This will just be, and it's such a clinically useful tool. Yeah. I mean, like, that's the whole, that's the incredible thing about it, capturing people when they are coming right out of a very distressful mm -hmm. um, situation. You could, you could, this is going to be, it's going to be a long, yeah, this is a long haul. <laughs> it's, it's, it's so, it's going to make such an impact. So, Thank you. Yes, last question. Mm 
standard definition to your to the nurses before they took this? Yes, the definition was present on the picture of the thermometer. They, so they had to know, again, you have to define what they're being asked to rate. So that was very important, which is why I showed you what the definition was that we used. And then did you control for which survey they took first? No, did I do a random sample of if they did the thermometer first versus the moral distress scale first? No, we did. And, and some of the challenges of this, that's a very good question. Some of the challenges in this are, um, you know, a lot of these tools were designed in the paper world. <laughs> Well, we know survey response rate is much better if you do it electronically. So we did face. So we didn't have a true visual analog scale because they couldn't mark electronically where on the. They had to pick a number. So it, it's not perfect. It's not perfect. But some of this is, I think, a lot of researchers are going to face this challenge when they. Most people will now. They want to do surveys electronically. What would have happened if we'd done a random sample of? You know, oh, you're going to get the moral distress thermometer first, and then you're going to get the moral distress scale. I think if I have a dedicated group of people, I might be willing to do that. But I was so worried about people finishing, and the fact that we had less than 50% of people who started actually complete the whole thing reinforces that. That when you ask them to do a 38-item thing, it's I'm pretty sure if they'd done the thermometer first and the 38-item tool, we would not have gotten both done because they would have dropped off after page one of the survey. So, but it's a good question. Okay, thanks, very thanks very much. I appreciate it.